The only reason I joined the RCMP is because I love dogs and I wanted to be a dog handler. Everybody's there because they want to be there. And the dogs that they're with are high drive dogs uh, that uh, certainly want to be there and certainly want to perform. It's just a recipe for success all the way around. Our expectations are that you will do your best and you'll do it consistently. Because when you get called out to go find that kid who's lost in the national park, you can't quit. You have to keep going. All for the love of the guy, eh? It's all about bond, eh? Guys have a good bond with the dogs. The dogs will really work hard for them, eh? It's all they want to do is just please. When Canada's Royal Canadian Mounted Police Force wants to find lost people, catch criminals, and uncover explosives, they call on an elite squad of Mounties. Highly trained assets with agile bodies, powerful jaws, and incredibly sharp noses. The training and selection process are rigorous and demanding. And those who ultimately make the cut never look back because there's no assignment too tough for the canine mounties. The Mountie in his dress uniform is one of Canada's most distinctive and iconic images. It's a living link to the past when the Northwest Mounted Police patrolled the West on horseback and the North on dog sled. But those dogs were more than transportation. Their instincts and their loyalty made them a valuable part of law enforcement. Even in this technological age, there's still no substitute for the sensitive nose and determination of a dog. It's almost impossible to overestimate the role that the canine police dogs play in the RCMP. From finding missing people to sniffing out drugs and explosives, the dog's special talents and their natural desire to bond with human beings makes them invaluable. There are about 140 general duty teams in the canine unit. Each dog is a product of selective breeding and careful training. The canine unit is a very specialized one. Every year, only 12 constables are chosen to take the course. And to get there, they've gone through a selection process that takes five or six years. They come here to the RCMP's training facility at Innisfil, Alberta, a town that's just south of Red Deer. When I got into the RCMP, I, I knew that the uh, police dog service was the section that I wanted to get into. And I was willing to do and work towards uh, that career regardless of how long it would be, whether it be five years, 10 years, um, I was willing to put that time in. Officers like Dan Block want to be part of the canine unit start by training a series of pups in their home division, putting them through an RCMP program called imprinting. This course involves the basic understanding of how to take care of a dog, but take care of the dog in a different way from a family pet. The dog that we're going to give them, we want them to raise that dog to become a police dog. There's some subtle differences that we ask for that they uh, uh, undertake with this dog to ensure that he receives and develops the behaviors that we're looking for in a police dog. The imprinting program is designed to help the dogs build their focus and their confidence by exposing them to as many situations as possible. The dog also is required to do a lot of things that a family pet doesn't do. So once you get that dog that we give you, uh, a person that's interested in the section, you have to spend uh, a lot of time taking the dog to places that police dogs might have to go. Easy example is a, an airport dog. A lot of family dogs will never go walk around an airport where a police dog is, is trained for explosives especially. We'll go there on a regular basis, up and down escalators, around lots of people, screaming jets in the background and all that kind of thing. So we ask them to expose these dogs to, to those type of environments. At any given time, about 100 constables across the country are working in their home division doing the imprinting training. They'll do this for five or six years before they're even considered for canine unit. Out of the 100 constables, only up to 12 a year are chosen to move up to become dog handlers. It's a long road for a puppy imprinter to become a dog handler, and it's a very committed uh, goal for them. Because often what happens is that is, uh, the puppy imprinters, for example, they might have to raise six puppies by the time they're even eligible to become a dog handler. We're looking for uh, guys that uh, can work on their own, uh, that are problem solvers, and that are able to uh, handle uh, 
high pressure situations, they're top performers. If they're suitable, uh, then they get selected to come on a, on a course. How many of you here are married? Well, your life has changed because, right, you've got the dog in the environment right now. You've had the dog in the environment for, what, two, three, four years? So that has a significant impact on what's going on in your family. It has a significant impact on where you're going on vacation. It has a sig you know? But you work your life around the dog, right? Whether that's right or wrong, that's what you do. But without this, we, just to generally as human beings, we're not going to do well. I think the part that's uh, not uh, well known is that when you're not working with your dog and you're not on shift in many areas across the country, you're actually on call because you're the only dog handler for large pieces of geography across the country. And a lot of units depend on you. Um, so you're on call. Um, and when that's not happening, that dog and that vehicle are, are living with your family. So it's uh, not just about a professional commitment, it's also a family commitment uh, uh, to police dog services. Okay, so one, Out of the hundreds two, who apply, three, only 12 constables are selected each year to take the training course that will make them dog handlers. Now, they'll find whether they can fulfill their dream, whether they have the right stuff to master the 85-day, three-level intensive course. Since the RCMP's canine program was established in 1935, the preferred breed has been the German Shepherd. They're natural hunters, and they're smart, loyal, even-tempered, and courageous. They're physically perfect for the challenges of the job in a country where the temperatures range from hot and humid in the summer to brutally cold in the winter. And they're powerful with significant bite power, making them perfect for catching the bad guys. But not just any German Shepherd makes a good police dog. So in 1999, the RCMP set up a breeding program using a combination of hand raising and science to create the perfect canine Mountie. From all the dogs that, that um, could have become a police dog, probably one in three of the pups that we breed will become a police dog. And that's just because of the, the package that we're looking for in a police dog uh, to be able to do the tracking, to do the searching, to do the uh, criminal apprehension. Um, to have the confidence to back up the dog handler and be civil enough to walk into a classroom if the dog handler's going in to do a school talk. You know, that dog's just gotta have solid nerves and, and be a confident dog. A police dog will serve an average of seven years before being retired. And so every year, the RCMP needs about 35 replacement dogs, trained and ready to go. Special dogs require special breeding, and for that, the RCMP turns to its friendly Alberta neighbors. There, there's a community of brood keepers not far from the Innisfil Kennels. These dog-loving foster families take on the responsibility of looking after the female dogs until they come into heat, like Sue and John Charles. Our job is basically to give them exercise, and they give us exercise too, and love and care and uh, watch them very carefully for any any illnesses or irregularities that they might have. We've learned to know when they're ready to breed and then we let the, um, the RCMP know right away. When the female comes into heat, we bring the dog in here and we do some daily blood tests on that dog. And when she's ready to be bred, we, we go through our selection process of which male we're gonna mate her to. Now the science part of the equation takes over. The vets match the female with the male to give the pups the right genetic mix. But there's no romantic candlelight dinner meeting for the male and female. The RCMP has a frozen sperm bank. When we got involved in the program a number of years ago. We're wondering what's the best way to, breed, to move a breeding program forward. And, and I think all the other species have documented that when we get involved with frozen semen, we can make huge strides genetic-wise. We have the semen here that if we find that now we have some extremely good genetics, we have access to it. Whereas in using the natural way, that dog may no longer be fertile. And so we've lost all that, all that genetics, you see what I'm saying? And, and certainly it allows us to pick and choose which, which dogs we, we want to use. A fascinating thing is that obviously with the RCMP, all their dogs are spread across Canada. So if we had one dog that we wanted to use today on a female that's here, rather than bringing the dog back each time and, and you know, not being able to work and, and so on, by having the, the frozen genetics here, we get to, get to use it. That's okay. What we'd like to do is do ultrasounds around day 28 to 30, 
that allows us to see whether the dog is pregnant, as well as to get a bit of an idea in terms of the size of the litter. My first uh, impression here is that we do have some puppies. There's a puppy there, a puppy there. We can see at least five puppies on this one. We know that they all have good heartbeats. And so I think everything looks, looks great. We'll document in the file that we have, at this point in time, we have at least five puppies. We'll then monitor that in terms of when we do an x-ray then at uh, just before whelping to confirm that we have maintained that pregnancy. Oh yes, you're very good, you're very good. Once the pregnancy is confirmed, the dog goes back to her foster parents who will care for her until the last 20 days before whelping. Good girl, good girl, stay. From the moment they're born, the puppies are under the watchful eye of the vet services. Before they're two weeks old, they're already being groomed and prepared for the canine unit. Starting at uh, day 10, uh, we'll start the early neurological uh, stimulation, and then we will um, put them on their back. We'll put them upside down a bit, and then we'll also put them upward, and then that will, uh, and we do that for five second count. Uh, and then we also do stimulation in between the toes to get them used to us uh, handling their feet. And then uh, we will also start a body massage at day 10. At um, two weeks old, we start taking them out of the whelping box and we will put them on the floor uh, with uh, articles on the floor to see how they interact. There's four different, there's several different surfaces that we uh, give them. And there's socks, there's rag toys, there's balls, and there's different scented gloves. And we want to see how they interact and how inquisitive they are at that point. At the end of each day, the kennel staff keeps a careful record of the progress of each of the pups. If they see any problems, they'll work on that the next day. At every stage, the dogs are exposed to more new stimuli so that the staff can see which of the pups has the right personality to be a police dog. Blow up a paper bag and you pow and make as loud a noise as you can with the paper bag and you see how the dog reacts. That's the first uh, one of the tests. So if the dog runs over to the corner and pees, chances are it's not going to make a great police dog, but it's just one of the eight, eight or nine different yes, tests yes. that we do. So then, then, we'll, then after the bag is broken, if the dog comes and wants to find, examine what made the noise, like, then, then that's a good thing. So then you take the, the bag and you throw it. And the next thing is to see if the dog will go and retrieve. Retrieval is basically a lot of what our training is based on. They have to have a high drive, high, in high drive instinct, and they have to have that retrieval instinct. The Mounties are looking for alpha qualities, behaviors that indicate intensity, focus, high drive, and dominant personality. Their ideal dog is brave, confident, and a quick learner. A big part of the work of the canine units involves tracking, so as soon as he can, RCMP kennel staffer Kerry Russell gets those little puppies outside. His goal is to start them early at developing their noses. Asphalt, gravel, there's flower beds, there's shavings beds, all sorts of different scents that we can expose these puppies to, let alone the tall grass or uh, some areas are difficult to get through where they have to fight and, and learn to climb through the bushes. He's teaching the pups another valuable lesson, how to follow the leader in spite of distractions. He takes them on a walk near a busy, noisy highway, and the goal is to make sure they stay focused on him. I would be surprised that these puppies are in their little computer brain on scents, or probably 60 to 80 different scents that they will already know, as opposed to other pups at this age, which people normally would raise, might only know five or six different scents. So their tertiary memory is wow. For puppies, if we all could understand that for each month the puppy grows is equal to one year of the human child. So when these puppies are leaving here at eight weeks of age, that's like a two-year-old child. And I don't ever overestimate a pup where he can, where you might fail. I always make it so they are a winner. That builds their confidence and their boldness and so on. So again, when these puppies leave here and they know all these um, obstacles, it's, their whole world is open to them. They know it all just about. The four-footed members of the RCMP's elite canine team are a product of selective breeding and a training program that begins when they're just eight weeks old. Not all the puppies will make it through, 
But the ones that do are smart, confident, well-socialized, and exposed to stimuli way beyond what a family pet will ever have to deal with. It's all part of creating the perfect police dog. A dog that has a certain level of independence, a certain level of confidence in himself, and outward uh, dominance that's there to a certain extent, and that just requires different things. And as for the human member of the canine team, constables who want to be considered for the unit spend about five years in the field working with dogs. I actually got to do a track after I had about two years into the force with a dog handler. And uh, after doing the track, I just fell in love with the dogs and what they could do and uh, all that sort of stuff. I was always around dogs growing up, but once I saw a dog that could actually track and work, I just it's what I wanted to do. We're trying to find the best people for the job. The thing is, is I don't want to string any of anybody along either. I don't want to have anybody raise dogs for us just for the fun of or for because we need it done. I want to have people who truly want to be here. There's a thousand people that have checked off that they want to be a dog handler. But, uh, I mean, there's only 140 of you in the, whole, in the whole country. Only 12 constables are chosen every year to take the course. They're brought to Innisfil, Alberta to take an intensive three-level, 85-day training course. So there's four or five days of lectures at the start of the course where a lot of theory is presented to them and they have to grasp it relatively quickly. And then in that second week, or sometimes in the afternoons even in the first week, they're starting to get some basics uh, of the actual handling of a dog some tracking, some obedience, and some criminal apprehension that they start taking part in. Ready to go search? It's a lot very quickly that they have to learn because you can't afford to make a lot of mistakes with the dog in his training. It has to progress steadily, consistently, to get to the end of level one. The trainers here, they want you to succeed. So if you're, the, if you're a learner and you're here to, uh, you know, keep your mouth shut and your ears open and, uh, take what they're giving you, I think you'll be successful. Now it's the real thing, right? And uh, a lot of people are curious as to how it all works. Some people think it's, so there's a little bit of magic involved, but really working a dog is just a lot of hard work, love and patience and all that kind of stuff. Over and over again, the constables will be reminded that the most important thing is the quality of the relationship they have with their dogs. This comes out in different ways in the literature. It comes out as patience, comes out as uh, the ability, what do you think, the ability to read the dog. It also comes out as being genuine. Have that genuine interest in the animal and how the animal's doing, how the animal feels, how, how, how to be able to read that animal, right? And that's something that, that, that Dave's gonna work with you on right through from now till the time you're done. You gotta be able to know what that dog's thinking to some degree. What you need to understand is our expectations are that you will do your best and you'll do it consistently. Because when you get called out to go find that kid who's lost in the national park, you can't quit, you have to keep going. So we're happy to have you, and I think you're all pretty happy to be here. So um, basically just go do your best. After only four days in the classroom learning theory, it's out to the field for what they've been waiting for. Let the training begin. Of the hundreds that apply, only 12 constables a year are selected to come to Innisfil, Alberta to learn how to become a member of the RCMP's elite canine unit. And now, those chosen few are heading out into the fields to learn how it's done. The RCMP constables are having to assimilate a lot of information at once. Not only are they learning the ins and outs of the job of being a dog handler, but they're also learning how to train their dog on the job. The start, basically what we have here, it's just a scent pad. When we're first starting the dogs off, that's why we had a nice little scent pad, scent is pulled. So what the guys will do is they'll bring the dog out, they'll harness the dog right on the scent pad, snap on the long line, and uh, tell, give the command there for the dog to track. Before handlers and dogs set out on their initial run, a handler is assigned to lay down a clear, easy to follow scent by scuffing the ground. This will be repeated as the dogs and handlers get used to it. The dogs are being taught to follow a scent trail. The constables are learning what might be the most important lesson, to simultaneously use your judgment and to follow the mantra of the canine section, trust your dog. You're taught not to really guess where, where the track is gonna go because that could lead you astray. I mean, you just gotta read your dog's body movements 
and uh, his indications. And he's, he's the one that's gonna give you where the track is gonna go. This is the essence of level one, tracking. The biggest lesson, holding the long line with confidence and reading your dog's signals so that it can follow the scent trail to find the object of the search. I mean, for you to guess where it's gonna go, it could get you in a lot of trouble or, or you know, stray you off the track, you're probably gonna haul the dog off because you believe it's there, but the dog knows exactly where it is. And you've just gotta believe in, in him. Life's too loose. That's why he's all over the place. The dogs are in the handler's confidence, so we're slowly uh, uh, eliminating the scuffing. Uh, we're going to get to the point where uh, there will be no scuffing at all. So good job, and just this last little bit? Trust the dog. Trust the dog. And when you wait five years to do something, no matter how tired you are, um, you know, you just got to pull through it. Uh, training's 85 days if everything goes well, and you just hope everything goes well. Next time on Canine Mounties, uh, like I said, it's only day five, I don't know, uh, maybe day uh, 45. Uh, the guys may be starting to get tired of me there too, but uh, so far, so good. So. Training requires repetition, day after day. Passing level one means increasing skills from dogs and handlers alike. And the most vital skill for the handlers to develop is the ability to trust your dog.